Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for Clark College's InTech department. This is InTech 222, Routing and Switching Essentials, Chapter 3, Dynamic Routing. Last week, we looked in Chapter 2 at static routing and got a good understanding of what routing is, as well as how to manually configure it with static routes. This week, we'll be looking at how to use automagic routing protocols that create their own routes. Let's take a look at dynamic routing protocols. They've been used in networks since the late 80s, and they've been updated several times to uh, accommodate what we call variable length subnets first, and then now IPv6, the newest routed protocol. So our routed protocols are IPv4 and IPv6. Our routing protocols, protocols that route the routed protocols, are protocols like RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, and BGP, as you can see in this diagram. They fall into two broad categories, interior gateway protocols, the acronym is IGPs, and exterior gateway protocols, the acronym EGPs. Interior gateway protocols are routing protocols that we would use inside a company's network. So that would be within the lands and WANs that comprise one company or organization, such as Clark College, Nike, Wells Fargo. You get the idea. Exterior gateway protocols are the routing protocols used between these organizations, so they would be used exclusively by Internet Service Providers, or ISPs. And the example that we're provided is BGP. In the CCNA curriculum, we will look just a tiny bit at BGP and how to configure it, but mainly in terms of a handoff from our interior protocols to hand that routing information off to BGP. We'll deal almost exclusively with interior gateway protocols. So within the interior gateway protocols, there are two types, distance vector and link state. So all of the interior gateway protocols, or IGPs, fall into one of two categories, distance vector or link state. You might also want to write down, since you're writing these, the third type, which is path vector, which is the type used with exterior gateway protocols. Back to our focus on interior gateway protocols, our examples of distance vector are RIP and EIGRP. Notice that they have different versions for IPv4 and IPv6. This is going to be true of all routing protocols, and this has a really cool advantage. Although it's an extra hassle to set up one protocol for IPv4 and then set it up again for IPv6, later in the future, when you're no longer running IPv4, you can just um, disband the IPv4 one, leaving the IPv6 one up and running. So it's kind of nice that it's modular instead of trying to build all that into a single protocol run. Link state, our examples are OSPF and ISIS. And if you do some Wikipedia research, you'll see that OSPF and ISIS are cousins. They originally came out of the same routing protocol. Routing protocols are used to facilitate the exchange of routing information between routers. So these dynamic routing protocols, they self-discover remote networks on their own by, we call it routing by rumor, by chit-chatting with their neighbor routers, they learn of remote destinations and the paths to them. They maintain up-to-date routing information to reach these remote destinations, constantly getting new information and weighing it against the old information and finding best path decisions. So they work best on networks that are undergoing constant change or are large and complex or have more than one path to reach a destination. They have the ability to find a best new path if a current path becomes unavailable. So they change and, and update themselves with the um, changing network topology. The main components of dynamic routing protocols would be the data structures, so they usually keep two or three or four separate tables. They usually have a table called the neighbor table that's just a list of all the routers um, running that same routing protocol that are adjacent to them. So they keep this adjacency or neighbor table. And then they usually keep a uh, topology table that has all of the routes they've learned from all of the routers. 
and then they uh, obviously have the routing table and sometimes some others. These tables are all kept in RAM, so they take a fair amount of your RAM, especially if you have a lot of routes and a lot of routers. They also have some type of message structure. So these messages are sent between routers and their neighbors to inform the neighbor routers about new routes that might be available or changes in routes. And they send these at varying frequencies depending on the routing protocol, but all dynamic routing protocols have a message that they send back and forth between the routers. And all dynamic routing protocols have an algorithm. And the algorithm is simply the mathematical formula or the programming, if you will, um, that is CPU intensive, that takes the information that you're getting in these messages and puts it into the various tables. And so you need something that reads the messages and makes sense of the information and then appends it into the table structures so that it can be, uh, it can be used for routing. So that's called the you know, routing protocol algorithm. And each routing protocol has its own and different algorithm. And each algorithm has different advantages and disadvantages or limitations. Let's talk about static routing. Remember that last chapter? Static routing is pretty easy. You just manually type in all of the remote destinations you want a router to be able to get to, and then you can get there. But it's a lot of work. And you can imagine, and we looked at that last week, if a couple of your destinations change, you have to go back into all the routers and update them on those changes every time. And it can be unwieldy and overwhelming and error prone to do that. So generally, we don't use static routing on our network as our primary routing, but we often see both static and dynamic routing used together on a modern network. One place we would use static routes is when we are doing route summarization. We often will manually summarize a routing table with route summarization. We also often um, provide routing to stub networks using static routes. A stub network, there's only one way in and one way out, so there's no best path determination. That's an only path. And so a uh, static route might be very appropriate there. Additionally, we use it as a default route to find the way out of our network, generally to the internet. A default route typically points to the ISP that you are connected to. And we do that because dynamic routing actually can't find the internet on its own. So we always have a default route. So I would say safely, any network connected to the internet has a default route and a default route is classified as a static route. So even if you're using dynamic routing, you're likely to have at least one static route that you use on your network. So you're not allowed to forget static routing. You're going to always need to provide a few static routes to help supplement the dynamic routing. Again, as a review, here's a network with only one path to every destination. That's so there's only one way to get anywhere. So there's no path determination. Is this path better than that path? There's just one way uh, to get anywhere. And if we then assume that this network is unchanging, that it's not going to be scaled and additional networks added and networks change and moved and links added around. If that's not um, part of our situation, then static routing might be the most appropriate for this given topology. So as a review then, we can take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of static routes. This will be on the exam. I'd write it down in my notes on the CCNA exam or the CSENT exam. You'll have to obviously memorize this, but it's pretty easy to understand that static routes are best for small networks that don't see a lot of changes and have only one path. And um, they are also good if you have cheap routers, routers that don't have a lot of RAM and CPU. And they don't mention this, but also bandwidth. Static routes are excellent in low bandwidth, like a dial-up. If you were <laughs> unfortunate enough to have to use a dial-up connection, a modem between uh, two locations, static routes would be really preferable because of the low bandwidth um, static routes don't use any of your bandwidth because they, they never talk to the neighbor routers. Um, but they have disadvantages. They're not suitable for topologies that go through a lot of changes or that are large and complex. And manual intervention is required all the time, which is error prone and unwieldy. 
Dynamic routing. It also has advantages and disadvantages. They're essentially mirror the uh, static routing that we just looked at. One advantage is you can use dynamic routing anywhere. You can use it on small, simple topologies. You can use it anywhere, any size network it works from the very small to the very big. And it's automatically readjusting to topology changes. So it will always uh, adjust to find the best path through your network. It adjusts to outages, sudden outages, loss of a link, or um, it maybe you have uh, two links. It can look at which one is less congested or has higher bandwidth, that sort of thing. I really don't think it's more complex to implement, but that's what your book says. Uh, Dwight tells you, no, it's not more complex. We'll see what you think when you do the labs. I'd like to hear from you in the discussion forum for this week. Do you think it's more complex to implement dynamic routes than it was to implement the static routes. I think actually it's easier to do dynamic routes in terms of implementation. It is less secure, although we do have additional um, configuration we can do to add encryption and uh, limit which ports the um, dynamic routing protocol is sending its updates out and so forth. So there are some extra things we can do to make it more secure. But anytime you're sending your routing information out on the wire, it's going to be less secure than not doing that, which is what static routing does. So um, I would say it's less secure for sure. And the route depends on the current topology, meaning you never really know the route in a large complex network. The routes could be changing quite frequently. So it's really hard from like a troubleshooting or documentation standpoint to really know what route your traffic is really taking at any given time. You could run a trace route and uh, find a path through the network, but there's no guarantee that five minutes later, that's the same path that traffic is taking then. It's always adjusting. And it does require additional CPU RAM and a uh, bandwidth to be able to operate. These are really, again, not a big disadvantage in today's world. 10 years ago, yes, CPU RAM and bandwidth were a big concern because we didn't have a lot of them and RAM cost a lot of money and bandwidth was down in the kilobits per second ratings. Today, bandwidth has gone up a thousand fold where we have probably 1000 times the bandwidth we had 10 years ago. So we're measuring our bandwidth in megabits per second and sometimes even gigabits per second. Also, as you know, CPUs have gone multi-CPU. It's a lot more computational power and RAM has become not only cheap, but a lot of it and it's very easy to upgrade your RAM today on any device and get two, three, four times the RAM that it ships with. So I would say that also is not a big disadvantage. So we really kind of scratched out the first and last disadvantage and that leaves us with two real disadvantages. Now unfortunately for the exam you need to know all four but in today's world I think really you're only looking at two disadvantages. We're going to look at one dynamic routing protocol in this chapter. RIP. I like to call RIP the rest in peace protocol and uh, there's a reason for that. It's the oldest of the dynamic routing protocols. It was the very first one to come out and it is the most limiting. It has the least capabilities and features and it's actually self-restricted to a certain size network so it's only appropriate for smaller networks. But it has all the all the basics of any dynamic routing protocol so it makes a great one for students to start uh, start using and playing around with. So that's what we're going to do is look at RIP. So this is it right here on this slide is how you configure a dynamic routing protocol. Uh, you tell me if that's very complicated, but you simply type router and then the name of the routing protocol, in this case RIP, or if you want to DIGRP, it would be router EIGRP or OSPF router OSPF, you get the idea. You could just do a router and then a question mark and it would list all the available routing protocols that are supported on your particular router. But for this chapter, we'll type router RIP. And that takes us into the router sub prompt. You see, we're now at the configuration sub, sub prompt for a router and we can add our network statements. These are the directly connected networks. So notice that we're adding directly connected network 192.168.10 and network 192.168.20. Those are the two directly connected networks. If you're unsure what your directly connected networks are, you could always do a do show route and it would list them with a C in front of them. And any network listed with a C needs to have a network statement here under the router sub configuration prompt. 
So your notice for router one here, we're not listing router two's networks or router three's. This is backwards from static routes. We're not telling router one where the remote destinations are. We are telling router one which directly connected networks it is allowed to advertise to its neighbors. So for this class, that will always be every available network that's directly connected. So router two would have three network statements, one for the serial 000 link, one for the serial 001 link, and one for the gig 00 link. Router three would have two. So that's how it's done. Now, one thing that we would probably want to add here, you saw in the previous slide, we're configuring router RIP version two. So by default, RIP goes to version one. The difference is going to be that version one uses classful subnetting and version two uses variable length subnetting. You may have seen that in a previous slide, may not, it's in your chapter material. So you would just type the command version two after you type your network statements and that would turn router rip into version two. In this demo, we're going to configure basic rip by advertising our directly connected networks. This network has been minimally configured with nothing but host names and IP addresses on the router interfaces. We go into our device, router one, and look at our routing table, we will see we have nothing but directly connected interfaces and those are the two that we expect to see on router one. Let's go ahead and configure it. We would type router rip that's going to activate the RIP routing protocol. Now we just need to advertise our directly connected networks. One tip if you haven't already brought up your show IP route is you could do a do show IP route and bring up the IP route so you have your directly connected networks as an easy reference. Then just add each one of the C networks, the directly connected networks as a network statement. You'll want to do this on each router. At this point, your network is fully configured for RIP. Let's verify it. You will now see three RIP route entries for this router, representing the three remote destinations that Router 3 is not directly connected to. Since there are five destinations on this network and we have two of them directly connected as our C links, we have three RIP routes. Let's look at Router 2. In Router 2, we can see three directly connected networks and two R routes, which the R designates a RIP route, and that would uh, be consistent with the topology we see on the left. And router 1 similarly has two directly connected interfaces and three RIP routes, and we can ping end to end. We could do a trace route. This concludes the demo for basic RIP configuration. If we type show IP protocols, it's going to list each routing protocol we're running. Remember, you can run more than one. We could run RIP and DIGRP or um, RIP version 2 and RIP version um, you know, one and you know, whatever we, we kind of want to do here. So here we're running single routing protocol. We'll be doing that pretty much all quarter. When we get into our next class, into our more advanced Cisco CCNA3 course, we'll be looking at running two routing protocols simultaneously and handing routes from one to another, but we don't do that this quarter.
So there's your information on RIP. Notice that it is sending updates every 30 seconds. The next update says it's due in 16 seconds. And it's saying that updates that it receives are invalid after 180 seconds. Right? And they're flushed after 240. So it has to keep getting updated information or if it doesn't hear about a network in 240 seconds, it will flush references to networks. So as it learns about new destinations, it adds them to the table, but it time and date stamps them. And after 240 seconds, it throws them away if they haven't been reconfirmed. So the neighbors have to keep reconfirming those destinations within that um, threshold of uh, 240 seconds. After 180 seconds, it stays in the table, but the router stops routing to them unless they're confirmed. And after 240, they're deleted entirely. So that's how you read that information. All of these timers uh, for 30 seconds, 180 and 240 can be adjusted, but we don't do that again in this course. We use the defaults. So you're going to want to basically write down all of these defaults because they are testable items. Default version control. You can see that by default, this is using RIP version one. It's able to receive one and two though. So if a RIP version two router sent it an update, it would accept that. Notice it is receiving on both version one and version two, but it is only sending version one. This is what I said on the prior slide where by default, when you type router RIP, it's going to go into version one. You have to actually type the command version two. And if you had done that, you would see that instead it would be sending version two and receiving one and two. It's always receiving one and two that allows it to, if you have an old router running version one, it'll be able to continue to um, receive those, those updates. You can see the different um, paths that it has determined for the different um, networks it's advertising. It has auto summarization in effect, so it will uh, do summarization. We talked about manual summarization last weak and dynamic routing protocols can summarize for you automatically. More on that later, but suffice to say they do a terrible job of it. So usually we turn off auto summarization because it usually causes more problems than it helps. But right now it's on, we're just learning the defaults and we're seeing there's my two directly connected networks that I mentioned from the prior slide. They're listed there. Those are the two networks being advertised and we can see this is the gateway router that information is, um, is being sent to there. And we have our default distance. And you can see the last update from this neighbor was 15 seconds ago. That's basically how you read that. We don't look at the show IP protocols very often. We just look at it after we set up a routing protocol and make sure all of the settings look uh, the way we want them to. And then normally where we look is the show IP route. So here under show IP route, we're taking a look at all of our RIP routes. And you can see there are three RIP routes being populated, all going out the same interface as 000. Let's jump back a slide, and we can take a look at the topology and see why that is. Router 1's remote destinations would all be out S000, because the gig 00 is a directly connected. There's no remotes. And we can see that there are some hidden networks from the perspective of router one. Since router one can't see anything beyond router two, it can't see router two's gig zero zero, which is the 192.168.3.0 network, can't see that one, can't see the 192.168.4.0 network, and it can't see the 192.168.5.0 network. So that makes sense. There are three remote networks that router one is unable to see without assistance. And the routing protocol is as you can see here in the routing table, learned, the R means it was learned through RIP. It has learned about those three remote destinations. The C's are it's directly connected as we would expect router one is two directly connected networks and has learned about the three others that it is not directly connected to. This together, this routing table would be said to be converged or complete. This router knows about all destinations on the network and it's in good shape. That's how you read a routing table. You want to make sure that the routing protocol is correctly interpreting the topology and populating with all of the destinations. Why wouldn't it? It might not uh, populate with all the destinations if, for instance, you misconfigured um, one of the other routers. 
So you might have a fat finger mistake to, uh, command on the other router. Maybe you didn't set up RIP or you left out a network statement. So uh, maybe one of the destination networks is just not being advertised to you. So that that is a nice check and balance to get used to not just trusting that RIP did it, but going in and verifying that RIP has configured itself correctly. Here we're going back in this slide, they're going back and adding uh, version two. And you notice that once we add version two, it is updated to the version two standard. Now we get into some of the security features that you might want to look at. So one of those is called passive interface and passive interface is simply saying, let's take a look at router one, for instance, why are we sending routing table updates out the gig zero zero port on router one? See by default, your routing protocol sends its neighbor table updates out all interfaces, just in case a router's out there. It doesn't really know where the neighbor routers are. So it blindly sends it out all available interfaces. Well, since we know there's never going to be a router on gig zero zero because it's a LAN where we have printers and phones and PCs, but we don't have a router and we're never going to have a router there. We're just wasting our bandwidth and we're wasting resources. All those devices will be getting this um, as either a multicast or a broadcast, depending on the version of RIP you're running. And it creates a potential security risk where you would have unknown uh, parties, probably hackers, that have compromised a desktop workstation or a printer port and they've hacked in and are listening for these routing table updates. So why send them out there at all? So the better thing is to go into router rip and add the command passive interface and list the interfaces. You have to type the command once for each interface you want to make passive. Uh, in this case, we only have one we want to make passive. And what this does is prevent the router from sending the routing table out those interfaces. And finally, we need a default route. You never need a default route if you don't have an internet. So they've added an internet to our topology. There's no point to have a default route if you have a closed network because you should be able to determine all the remote destinations just fine by router RIP. But remember I said dyna a dynamic routing protocol, those interior gateway protocols can only find the interior destinations. They're incapable of finding outside destinations like the internet. So they can't find the, the exit door. They know they have a map of everything in the, in the building, but they can't find a way out of the building. So you got to help them. And the way we help them is by adding a static route called that quad zero or default route. And we tell it where the door is. So we go to the router closest to the door 
and we point our static route out the door. In this case, we're pointing the static route out the S001 interface towards our ISP router at 209.165.200.224. There's your static route right at the top, and then we're going into the routing protocol and we're typing default information originate. Yet another specific command you can add to router RIP or any routing protocol. And what this will do is take that static route and deliver it for you automatically. RIP will carry it with the other routing table updates. Even though it's a static route, you don't have to type it in router two and router three. RIP will take care of doing that for you. So it'll pick up that default route. That's why it's called default information originate. It will pick up your default route add it to the RIP routing update and send it to router two. Now it's a RIP update, so router two will automatically forward it to router three. So if we were to go look in router three, it in fact would now have a 000 route pointing out its S001 interface. And so would router two pointing out its S00 interface. And so it's a nice way to conveniently wrap up a default route and distribute it without having to type that default route into each device. Let's talk about the routing table. Here's a topology similar to the one we had before, some different IPs to shake things up, added a few remote destinations here. So we take a look here and what are we seeing? We're seeing a default route. See so you have a static route and the asterisk by the static route indicates it is a default. So we see we have that default route. We can tell we're in router one. We're looking at the routing table of router one. Let's refer back to our topology. Router one has that internet sitting on S001. That would be the default route. And then we have the other two interfaces. And we can see those as the C's. You can see that we have some C interfaces there on gig 00, and we have another one on our S001. Now, I think they made a mistake here. Oh, no, S001, that's right. That also, that's where we go to the internet. So there are, there are, I forgot we added the internet. If you remember earlier, we only had two directly connected networks, but we added the internet. So router one has now has three directly connected networks. So that's why we see three C's. Uh, remember the L is the same as the C, but it is the actual IP address the router has in that network. And so if we look at the first C, 172.16.1.0, that's the directly connected network on the gig 00 port. The IP address on the gig 00 port is the L underneath it, 172.16.1.1. If we were to do a show run and look at the IP address configured on the gig 00 port, that would be it. So the Ls are just there as a convenient way to know what IP the router has in those directly connected networks. The other statements in this table are the RIP routes. And how many of them do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Going back to our topology, we want to verify that there are five remote destinations from the perspective of router one. We caught the three C's, there they are there. And let's count the remaining networks. One, two, three, four, five. There are five of them. Sure enough, we have a complete routing table. I would say that router one is good to go, of course, We'd want to go a little further and make sure those uh, network IP addresses matched with our topology table. So let's talk about the anatomy of the routing table. I already talked about uh, route source, the C's and the L's and what those mean for you. And then you have the destination, which of course in a directly connected network indicated by the C or the L, it is um, going to be one that's not a remote destination, so it's a directly connected destination. And it tells you what port on the router, what physical port the router is using to reach that destination. Here's it broken down in great detail, and you have this to read in your uh, ebook chapter, but it has all the um, relevant information that you need. You have the route source, that's the protocol that provides the route information. It could be S for static, C for directly connected, R for RIP, E for EIGRP, or O for OSPF. Then you would have your destination network. That's the IP address of the destination um, network ID uh, with the mask. And then you have your administrative distance, which remember is used for comparison. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> used for comparison 
with other routes in the routing table to that same destination. So the metric and administrative distance are meaningless unless you have a second entry into the table that goes to that same destination. If you had two entries in the table, both going to 172.16.4.0 slash 28, you would compare the administrative distance of those two route entries and choose the one with the lowest AD number. So for instance, 90 would trump 120, one would trump 90, and zero would trump one. Once you had the best AD, and let's say the AD for some reason matches, they're both 120. You would then, as a backup, then if you had a tie and you had two that had the same lowest AD, you would choose the one with the lowest metric. If you had a tie again, you would load balance and you would just round robin your packets across the two links because they would be seen as equally uh, desirable. Then it tells you what next top address is being used to reach that network. That would be the next closest router or the neighbor router's uh, closest interface to this router. And you see how long ago this router learned the information. It came in a RIP update 12 seconds ago. And remember from an earlier slide, it will see this information as valid for 180 seconds. And every time it gets reconfirmed by an update, this route stamp will get updated back to zero. It'll get reset to zero every time a new routing update comes in, which is every 30 seconds, this counter should revert to zero. So if I see the counter go beyond 30, I know it wasn't included in the most recent routing table update or the most recent routing table update never arrived. And so if it goes beyond 30, that might indicate that we're having some problems with our routing table. Let's talk about some routing table terms. You can have what's called an ultimate route, a level one route, a level one parent route, and a level two child route. Let's talk about the ultimate route. An ultimate route is a routing table entry that contains either a next top IP or an exit interface. All right, so your directly connected networks, your dynamically learned networks, and linked local routes are all ultimate routes because they have either a next hop IP address or an exit interface to guide you in getting there. That's called an ultimate route. Level one route. So your level one routes have a network, subnet, or default route. And then they have, they have the uh, next top address or exit address to become an ultimate route. See that? Okay. So this graphic is showing the level one routes. Notice that the highlighted routes do not have exit interfaces. So that is a level one parent route. So those routes don't tell you how to get there. They list a destination. They say five subnets, three masks. They don't say how to get there. But the child routes do. So if we look at what's uh, nested underneath the parent routes are child routes. And those child routes are what we call a level two route. And so those are giving the information on how to get there. Okay. Well, that's just some terminology for you to learn. There's a terminology exercise in our online course shell. And I would encourage you to do that for this chapter because there's a lot of new terminology for you to um, kind of get used to when we talk about dynamic routing. Both the classification of routes as well as some of the, uh, some of the terms there. So here's the lookup process. So this is kind of the logic that a router goes through when it's looking for a route. If the best match is a level one ultimate route, then the route is used to forward the packet because an ultimate route has all the information you need to go forward and it just does that. If it's a parent route, it goes to the next step because it wouldn't know the exit interface. The next step says the router examines each child route that's nested under that parent to find the best match. So there could be more than one uh, child route that goes to that, uh, to that destination. If there is a match with a level two child route, then that's forwarded using that match, right? So level two child routes can be routed to and level one ultimate routes 
can be routed to, but level one parent routes cannot be routed to. If there is not a match with any of the level two child routes, go to the next step. The router continues searching level one supernet routes in the routing table for a match. Those are ultimate routes, by the way, level one uh, supernet routes, including the default route if there is one. So the default route is sometimes called the route of last resort. It's, um, it's the last route the router will consider. So if there is a default route, it will definitely send it there. That's a catch-all route that uh, is used at the end of the search. And if there is now a lesser match with a level one supernet or default route, the router uses that route and a lesser match would be the default route. If there is not a match with any route in the routing table, the router throws the packet away and goes on to the next one. So that's the process that would be followed. All right, let's take a look at uh, longest match logic. So what we're talking about here is if we have a destination packet with a slash 26, so 26 of the bits need to match on the destination packet. So our mask on this is slash 26. We have a route here that matches 12 bits, a route that matches the first 18 bits, and a match to 26. So 26 would be the longest bit match, making it the best route, irregardless of the AD and the metric. We first look for the longest match. So we're going to look for the longest bit match because that is the most accurate path to that destination. Okay, of course, IPv6 routing tables, pretty much identical. They have all the same concepts. They have static routes, dynamic routes, default routes. IPv6 is classless by design. So, you know, there's no reason there were no classful versions. So it's just classless. And when we're talking RIP, of course, that means there's three versions of RIP. There's original RIP, when you type router RIP, you become version two by adding version two. And to get um, RIP for IPv6, you have to actually type um, RIP NG. So you have to type router RIP NG for NG is for next generation. And we can type show IPv6 route and look at our IPv6 routes. And we can do the same kind of analysis of a routing table and dissection of the anatomy of a route that we did with IPv4 has the same exact information. Thank you. We'll see you next week.